Oppenheimer, the name of the incredible physicist that led the Manhattan Project and the name of the movie about him. Christopher Nolan, with a budget of $100 million, created a masterpiece of cinema, a three-hour movie detailing the start of the Manhattan Project and later Oppenheimer's own persecution. My favorite response, Oppenheimer couldn't run a hamburger stand. I couldn't. But I can run the Manhattan Project. With such a small budget, this movie went on to win seven Academy Awards, and it has so many accolades that there is a Wikipedia page dedicated to listing all of them. This includes the Public Service Award from the Federation of American Scientists. I didn't even know that was a thing. To make sure that he got all the physics right, Christopher Nolan taught himself quantum mechanics and did well enough that the science advisors said they didn't have much to do. And yet, they missed something, at least two somethings. Wait, what's he saying? The more you know about physics, the more likely it is you are going to miss it. The 1930s were an incredible time for physics. In 1930, Paul Dirac published his Principles of Quantum Mechanics that fundamentally changed how everybody thought of quantum mechanics and was born out of Dirac's dissertation work conducted while he was wrestling with Heisenberg's matrix formulation of quantum mechanics. <clears throat> I think I just lost like half my audience. This led to a flurry of new ideas, several of which were investigated by Oppenheimer, who was a professor at Berkeley from 1929 to 1940, when he was recruited for the Manhattan Project. Nolan presents Oppenheimer's time at Berkeley as energetic and exciting. Oppenheimer's students enthusiastically gather to learn more about quantum mechanics and relativity, and are even tasked with doing exciting original research. See where the math takes us. I guarantee it's somewhere no one's been before. Me? Yes, you. Your math is better than mine. <laughs> you can hear them talking about what happens when you get too much mass within a certain radius, which you and I know leads to a black hole, something that Nolan might be a bit familiar with. What's great about this movie is that they do seem to get much of the jargon and the physics right, and you can tell how much love Nolan has for Oppenheimer in the way he portrays him in the movie. That's why when I saw this flash by the screen, I couldn't believe it and I was pretty sure it was wrong. But I'm not a physicist. I'm a professor of mathematics. Math is close enough to physics that I can understand the mathematical language that they use, but not close enough that I could judge the actual physics with any expertise. Christopher Nolan probably knows more quantum mechanics than I do, so how can I prove that he is wrong here? And what was he wrong about? The only thing I could do is read all of Oppenheimer's papers from the time. So I set out to find everything Oppenheimer wrote from 1930 to 1939, uh, which is roughly when the scene was supposed to be taking place. Now, Oppenheimer published almost all of his work in the journal Physical Review. This includes not only his papers, but also a large number of letters of the editors which concern his work as well as work of others. But Physical Review has actually been out of print since 1969. Uh, more precisely, it's split into several different journals, and my university doesn't subscribe to the old physical review anymore. So I need to find a place where I could find all of his articles. Uh, there are two locations I could go. The Library of Congress, or, well, Los Alamos National Laboratory, and the library. I happen to be here in Los Alamos doing some work, and in fact, the original site of the Manhattan Project is open to tourists. You can go check out a variety of museums in town that'll give you the full history of the Manhattan Project and the role of Los Alamos in the decades that have followed. You can check out Fuller Lodge, where Oppenheimer gave his famous speech in the movie, and you can even walk around the grounds of Oppenheimer's house. Though Oppenheimer's home is actually off limits because it needs extensive repairs. I put a link in the description if you want to make a donation to Los Alamos Historical Society, and if you want to see a tour of Oppenheimer's home as it is today, then you can find a link to that at the end of this video. After some sleuthing, I found a complete list of all of Oppenheimer's papers, and if you click on these DOI links, they will take you to those particular publications. I have a link below if you want to check out those papers. Even without access to a university library, you can still read all of the abstracts to get a sense for what he was working on. Now, what was wrong with that board? And what am I looking for? On that board, we got a flash of something. Specifically, what I'm looking at 
is a notation. Now, this is going to get pedantic, but don't run off. Come back around this timestamp if you want to skip over all the little math details. What we saw on the board is called Dirac's Brockhead notation. It's a very useful way to write inner products from a Hilbert space. Essentially, physicists write them differently than mathematicians, where they fix the first variable in the inner product as being conjugate linear rather than the second. So the idea is that we can split this inner product into two pieces, a bra and a ket, and the bra represents a functional. The bra hits the ket on the left, just like a function would. And the result of this operation is whatever the inner product gives us. We can represent every operator by its action on a basis set and essentially write them as a sum of kets times bras. Let's see how this works in action. Suppose I have a basis for my Hilbert space, psi n. Then every element in the Hilbert space can be written as a series of psi n's. These psi n's could be a lot of different things. They could be sinusoids, or in the case of the quantum harmonic oscillator, Hermite functions. If I want to express an operator, which is a measurement in a quantum mechanics, then I can ask what is the action of this operator on each of my basis elements. Say the operator sends each psi to phi. That would be represented like this. And then the operator can be completely expressed in terms of these operations. And ultimately, it sends each psi n to phi n. It's pretty handy. So this notation with the bras and the kets are used all over the place in QM today. In fact, you can see ket written on Oppenheimer's board. There is just one problem. This notation wasn't published until July 1939, just a couple months before the scene, which supposedly happened at the latest, September 1939. Get Hartley. Get Hartley. September 1st, 1939. The world's going to remember this day. We've been upstage. It's really unlikely that Oppenheimer adopted this new way of writing QM that quickly, but this scene could have been a little bit after uh, the publication of Drock's paper. So I just realized that they showed a newspaper in the Brockhead scene. Put the uranium nucleus. Uh, now at my desktop with Photoshop, we can actually zoom in a bit and see exactly when this was, or at least roughly when it was. It's really still hard to see. So we look in here. This is where the date is. Now, that's really hard to, to make out, but essentially we have a J right there and a Y happening over here. Now it looks like it's like something like the 28th or so, something like that. And, uh, and this is going to be in 1938. Uh, and that is definitely a J, and it, it, that's not September. That I'm pretty sure that's a Y. Anyway, this happened in January of 1938. Of course, this was a real event that happened. So we aren't just stuck with like a fuzzy picture from a movie. We can actually go and look up when this happened to get us an idea of when the newspaper was published. And so here, if you take a look at the discovery of nuclear fission, this is on the Max Planck Institute for Chemistry's website, it says that the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Chemistry uh, is where they discovered nuclear fission. And, and that was in December, 1938. So that means that the paper couldn't have been January 1938, but it was in January 1939. That is a full six months before Dirac's paper was published, and Dirac's paper was submitted in April, so it was only a couple months turnaround time between the submission and the publication of that manuscript. And so Oppenheimer couldn't even have been a reviewer for that paper because it wasn't under review yet. So I think it's very unlikely that Oppenheimer was writing Brockhead notation on the board at that time. So did Oppenheimer adopt this brand new notation so quickly? My guess is no. If he did adopt it, however, then it should show up in some of his papers from the time. And so if we can find a paper of his that was submitted after this time in 1939 without the Brockhead notation, then it is strong evidence that the board work is wrong. Only a couple of Oppenheimer's papers were received after July 1939, and most of them don't deal with quantum mechanics, or at least don't explicitly use the inner product, except for this paper. Oppenheimer indeed leverages an inner product here when he is describing a quantity in QM. However, it doesn't have the Brockett notation. 
That is, it doesn't have a line. It has a comma right down the middle. And it uses parentheses rather than the angle brackets they usually associate with bra and ket. It does have psi and an operation. So we are looking at something you would use bra ket notation for. If Oppenheimer was thinking in terms of the Brockett notation, it's likely that would have made it into his manuscripts. So, this board is likely wrong. We don't have any evidence that Oppenheimer was actually using this notation introduced by Dirac, and the instruction from Dirac was at most weeks before the scene in the movie, if it happened before the scene at all. A practiced modern physicist gets so entrenched in the Brockett notation that they will probably see this and think, of course that belongs here. And in fact, the physicists I've spoke with uh, thought that the Brockhead notation appeared in Dirac's first edition of his book. You can actually look up the first edition online on archive.org and see for yourself it's not there. I'll put a link in the description below. Now, I promised two mistakes. The second one is much easier to explain. It's pretty clear to the audience what the problem was that Oppenheimer was working on black holes. Now, the Schwarzschild radius, which leads to the idea of event horizon, was first theorized by Schwarzschild while fighting in the trenches of World War I, about 20 years before the time of this movie. And the evolution of this was a main focus of Oppenheimer around that time. And in the movie, he asked his students to do the math for the problem. Now, when they are celebrating the publication of the paper in 1939, you can hear somebody say, black holes. Paper of black holes, it's it! Hardland. Except that no one was saying that. The term black hole was first coined in 1968, nearly 30 years later by the PSA advisor Richard Feynman, John Archibald Wheeler. Now, this might be intentionally inserted for the sake of the audience, and Christopher Nolan actually paid physicists a good deal of money to create these awesome simulations of black holes for his movie Interstellar. So, I can imagine he might just like them and want them mentioned in the movie. So, there you go. Mathematical investigative reporting. Christopher Nolan, your movie is absolutely amazing, and I have watched it too many times. But if you want a pedantic mathematician to double check your work in the future, give me a call. Now, if you want to learn more about Hubble spaces and machine learning, then you can check out this playlist here. And if you want to see a tour of Oppenheimer's home, well, you can check out this video over here. In any case, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a great day.